In January 2020, the novel coronavirus known as COVID-19 arrived in the United States. For the first time in modern history, we were in a global pandemic. Eight months later, Moderna Therapeutics, a small unproven drug maker, delivered our first COVID vaccine. In The First Shots, award-winning journalist Brendan Borrell presents a gripping chronicle of the race to develop the COVID-19 vaccine. Focusing on the unlikely heroes, a collaboration of brilliant scientists and dedicated public officials, The First Shots captures a triumphant moment in the history of science. For today's conversation, Brendan Borrell is joined by Apoorva Mandevilli, science and global health reporter for the New York Times. Copies of Brendan Borrell's book are available for purchase at Left Bank Books, St. Louis's premier independent bookstore. I'm Apoorva Mandavili. I'm a reporter at the New York Times, and I'm really happy to be here tonight to talk with Brandon Borrell, my friend and fellow science journalist, about his new book, The First Shots. Hi, Brandon. Hi there. It's amazing to have lived this and then read your telling of what happened behind the scenes. I learned so much reading your book. So tell me a little bit about how you got started. Tell me about the genesis of the book. When did you first come up with the idea and why this? Well, you know, it, as we all experienced in the beginning of 2020, it was a very chaotic and confusing time. I'm a freelance journalist writing for different magazines and I was planning out my year as this pandemic was unfolding. Um, and basically all of my projects kind of had to get pushed back down the line. There was no travel, there was no this. And I was glued to the screen reading quite often your articles of Forva, <laughs> you, you were in the thick of it. Um, and here I am, this remote freelancer trying to figure out, okay, how do I contribute my skills to this project? And uh, I think the, the first step for me was, was I, I called up an old source of mine. Uh, he's a doctor from Massachusetts General Hospital named Michael Callahan. And he's like this swashbuckling, infectious disease guy who's dropping into hot zones all over the world. I, I'd written a profile of him like 10 years earlier. And I thought, hey, maybe this guy's doing something interesting. So I finally reach him and he says, you know, I, I just got back from Wuhan and I'm working for the Trump administration. So I said, ah, <laughs> I'm gonna keep talking to you. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, he's he's a really interesting character and you started the book with him, right? So it, was, it, it really takes you into the action right away. So that was a really great choice. But, you know, you said um, you were reading a lot of my articles, but, you know, it was crazy to be writing those articles because we were learning about COVID every single day. So how did you make the decision to cover something that was changing on a daily basis? And how did you even begin to gather your information when things were changing on a daily, hourly, weekly basis? It was very hard for me to decide what to focus on. It was uh, you know, so so I, I talked to Callahan, and then I started writing a few essays here and there. And, and I, by March and April, we knew that the only way to end this pandemic or to reduce the mortality was a vaccine. Um, but even then, this this landscape was just it was changing fast, as you say. There was the basic science, much of which was new to me. I'm a science journalist but I don't cover immunology, vaccinology, all of that. I had to learn what antibodies were and how they were created again. I, I'd taken biology a long time ago, but yeah, the, the vaccine landscape was, was crazy. I mean, back then they were saying 250 companies are working on you know, vaccines. Operation Warp Speed had not even been announced. And I had agreed, uh, I signed a contract with the publisher that I was gonna somehow deliver a book and I needed to just sort of put out my feelers and figure out what direction was going to give me a story, a story that was going to kind of withstand this test of time, if I can say that, because I wanted something that people would be reading two years later and still get something out of it. And that was a challenge. 
I think you delivered on that because the behind the scenes look at how we got to the vaccines is so interesting. And I think people will be wanting to learn about that for quite a long time. You know, you said that you had to learn all about immunology and biology. And I think that was true for a lot of us. I, I didn't really know much about T cells and B cells when I started writing about the virus either. But given that the information was coming at us so quickly, I mean, how did you even report this thing on a, you know, as you went along, you know, figuring out um, what comes first, what comes second, the vaccines too, you said there were tons of candidates and my colleagues at the times created a vaccine tracker. And I think 95% of those candidates have fallen by the wayside. So how did you home in on Pfizer and Moderna and, and report that out? It was a scramble. It was, uh, I mean, the first thing I did after, well, while signing my, my publishing contract was I was putting out feelers to the big players. You know, in, in hindsight, we see that, say, Merck and Sanofi were not successful, but I think those were two of the first companies I might have reached out to. I was also looking at these small companies that I just thought, whoa, that's really neat. And I was, I, I, I thought when I started this that I was going to try to get in the room with some of these companies. I was going to try to get into Zoom meetings. I was going to experience things in real time, but I was completely shut out. And there's kind of that fake it till you make it attitude that you have to have as a reporter, which is like, all right, I can do this. I'm on the, the biggest story of my life and I'm gonna succeed. And then it was just doors were being shut. You know, we all know Moderna was a very secretive company. And I, I remember just being frustrated every time I like saw CEO Stefan Bonsell giving a quote somewhere else and then not talking to me. So it became just a strategic thing. Like, how do I get the information I need? And step by step, I started building more and more sources within the government. Because of course, with Operation Warp Speed, the companies are talking to the government. The companies are sending emails. There are... And there are notes and there are people who want to tell that story. And that became, you know, the, my way in. And that was, uh, became a thread of the whole book, which it, it kind of is the story of the creation of Operation Warp Speed and this incredibly historic public-private partnership. Tell me your secrets. How did you do that? <laughs> how did you convince your sources, first of all, to talk to you? And how did you make sure that they told you what happened in such colorful detailed way because we know that scientists and government people can be kind of dry and boring. So how did you manage to convince them to be colorful? It was a long process. I, I remember beginning this thinking, how am I going to make the vaccine development and regulatory process interesting without being in the room? Like you say, I, I was getting the door slammed in my face. I was not going to be a fly on the wall for conversation. So I had to reconstruct stuff after the fact. I was really at a loss most of the time um, until, you know, every once in a while I would sort of meet somebody who would say, hey, you know what, actually I have notes from that meeting or I have, do, would you like to take pictures of my calendar? And gradually, uh, you know, things opened up more and more kind of after the vaccines got approved in November, 2020. And then with the change of, of administration in January, 2021 was, was when the floodgates really opened in terms of sourcing. Um, I think as, as you know well, I mean, one source leads to another, you sort of develop a relationship. So I had some people in during sort of the pandemic year, like Michael Callahan, who eventually led me to some folks inside health and human services who were sort of talking to me, but they weren't giving me, yeah, those details that, uh, that I, I craved to put, put somebody in the room. So it, it wasn't, you know, it, it was just brute force of like, I got to do this. I need to go back to this person. I need to get some documentation of that. And I, I somehow managed to pull it off. <laughs> yeah. I think you more than pulled it off. It really has that sense of, you know, this gripping story that's developing with, you know, at a very fast pace. And actually, you know, that fast pace, uh, part of it is, is your writing style, but part of it is also, it was an insanely fast process, right? I mean, we have not seen vaccines come out this quickly. Can you talk a little bit about, about that and how, you know, I think a lot of the general public maybe doesn't fully appreciate how quickly this happened and to get at these amazingly good vaccines. So tell us a bit about that. We all know that, you know, we were told very early on in the pandemic, 
you know, we may not even need a vaccine. Oh, if we need a vaccine, it's not going to be, you know, to, for 18 months, maybe two years. Uh, Tony Fauci was talking about that timeline very early in the spring of 2020. And he's working with one of the leading vaccine developers on the COVID vaccine. And they all sort of had this sense of pessimism about the timeline. Um, and even I, going into this, I, I, I sort of started with the launch of Operation Warp Speed, and we heard these um, this bold timeline, oh, we're going to deliver 300 million doses by the end of 2020. And there was, you know, scientists, respected scientists, people who had developed vaccines in the past were just aghast at that idea. And it, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I think we didn't realize how much of the stop, what slows down vaccine uh, development is kind of the, the regulatory process and the money and the companies not wanting to take a risk. And when you sort of move some of those hurdles out of the way and you combine that with some good scientific luck, um, which I think is, is, I think people are very interested in hearing about, somehow that impossible timeline becomes possible. Um, but of course, these vaccines would not have happened if it hadn't been so much research preceding this pandemic. Number one, we had the, you know, the success of the mRNA platform, which had been under development for, you know, a dream for 20 years, 30 years, under development at Moderna for 10, honing everything from sort of this lipid that the mRNA is packaged in to how you actually get your this mRNA vaccine, these genetic instructions into the body cells where they can uh, stimulate the immune system just right to create that uh, response we need to, so we can develop antibodies. I mean, this, all of this stuff was just kind of like on tap the moment the pandemic broke out. How, I mean, if this had happened a year or two earlier, we would be in, we're still waiting, I think. Um, and then the second thing was we're kind of lucky that it was a coronavirus because there were people who, who were concerned about coronavirus. There's a small group of people, admittedly, who'd seen the first SARS outbreak uh, 20 years ago and then also were watching what was happening with, with there were these other related coronaviruses like Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And this is a lot of research was going into understanding these viruses, manipulating them and realizing that the spike of the coronavirus was going to be an ideal target to go for. And that was all ready to go right there in the beginning of 2020. So we kind of lucked out in that department as well. So scientific, regulatory, and then, hey, if you put $10 billion down, um, <laughs> you can speed things up quite, quite easily. But I, I think this whole process, of course, made people who want to take vaccines, very nervous. I, I, we've seen that, we're, we're still seeing that. People tell me all the time, you know, these vaccines were, were developed too quickly, they were approved too quickly. I, I don't know if I trust them. And I think one of the things I tried to do in the book is walk people through how these tough decisions were made and, and what went into all of this. I think one of the things that make people a little nervous is actually the name. And there's a fun story behind that. So maybe you can tell us how Operation Warp Speed came to be. It sounds like something you shouldn't trust that gets warp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the warp, the warp speed name's got, got a lot of issues. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's kind of funny because warp speed is so associated with the Trump administration. You think, oh yeah, this is kind of this overblown thing but it's actually the, the name comes from this nerdy vaccine regulator named Peter Marks, who was one of the architects behind the idea of warp speed. He was a Star Trek fan in his youth, and he kind of, you know, codenamed his, ver his project Project Warp Speed. But the funny thing is, actually, the, the administration didn't really like that name. They they, were, they had these other ideas. They were going to call it Manhattan Project 2.0. Then they wanted to call it Apollo's Moonshot. But uh, the week before Warp Speed was about to be announced, um, the, uh, Biden was giving an interview and he referred to an Apollo-like moonshot for a vaccine as necessary. And suddenly the, the politicos were like, we can't use the Apollo moonshot. And uh, they said a public affairs guy in the, in the health department saw Peter Marks in the hallway before he was going to a meeting. And he said, hey, what, what did you call it? And he said, Warp Speed. Uh, and that ended up in a Bloomberg news story that very day. So it was like named on the spot. <laughs> yeah. 
which is really kind of crazy when you think about it, because I think people did think it was, you know, put together like um, drug names are with, you know, some flashy committee and focus group. And, and no, no, it really was just Peter Marks and his Star Trek um, obsession. So that was a really funny sort of anecdote. And Peter Marks has been in the news so much lately because he's now, you know, the number two at the FDA and he makes so many decisions about boosters and vaccines, which we will talk about <laughs> a bit more. But you said early on, Mark and Sanofi, they didn't really succeed. And there was so much that had to be done for us to get to these mRNA vaccines. We were so lucky. Why is it so difficult to make vaccines? And, you know, there aren't a lot of companies that make them. A lot of them are actually in India. It's the biggest vaccine manufacturer. But in the rest of the world, there hasn't been this really strong tradition of making vaccines in the last few decades. And, and why is that? Yeah, I think the reputation within the pharmaceutical industry is that they are not big winners, um, apart from, say, the, the seasonal flu vaccines and, um, you know, a, a few infectious disease vaccines out there. Most of the time when an emerging disease like the coronavirus or, say, an Ebola outbreak emerges, it disappears before you have a population to test it on. Um, you, you, in order to test a vaccine, you actually have to have people who are at risk of catching a disease. But if the disease fades out, then you might know, okay, this vaccine's safe, but I don't actually know how effective it is. Um, and then ultimately, you don't have anyone to sell it to. So much of the vaccine research takes place in, the, in academic laboratories, in nonprofit institutions. Um, and then only later on is it, with some luck, picked up by pharmaceutical companies, which know how to actually make a vaccine, uh, make it to the standards that we need to get it through the FDA. And yeah, in the beginning of the of the COVID pandemic, uh, there was, uh, you know, I, I describe in my book the scene at, at Davos, uh, where all these major vaccine manufacturers are there in early January, that everybody's seeing the news about Wuhan, but the vaccine manufacturers want to talk about their flu vaccine. And they're basically, Merck and Sanofi are like, we're, we're just going to watch and see what happens. I mean, of course, there were some back channel negotiations happening. Um, Pfizer, you know, very explicitly told BioNTech, its biotech partner in Germany, uh, no, we don't think we're going to do a COVID vaccine right now. You know, but of course, they were able to pivot. And that's, that's the big story is, is that, that Pfizer actually did step into the game. Um, but the other companies, yeah, they, they lost what would have been, I mean, what is for Pfizer one its biggest product this year? <laughs> so it tells, you know, it makes you wonder about that sort of common view that vaccines are not money makers. Actually, you know, maybe, maybe they aren't. And when I was working on the book, trying to actually get the data to look at how much companies profit from vaccines was actually pretty tough. Um, that is the view. You're going to make more money from rare diseases, from cancer medicines. Um, but clearly, uh, a big disease like this is uh, a good gamble. Even if they have all of the intention, having that market is so important because it's, I mean, infectious diseases are really such a much bigger problem in the global South. I just recently wrote about the malaria vaccine, the first ever malaria vaccine, and it took 30 years to get that vaccine. And there are almost no players in that. And now that they have it, the financing is going to be so difficult. You know, Gavi has to basically commit to buying millions of doses so that African kids can live. It's, it's a very um, messed up system in many ways. So it's great that it worked out for us, but it doesn't seem like it's really set up to help people when it doesn't affect the entire world. The other example is the HIV vaccine, which has been such a scientific challenge. It, that is a much more difficult disease to attack than, um, than COVID. Um, and, and, and I just want to go back to kind of why, why vaccines are difficult to develop, which is, you know, going back to the safety issues, which is with a, with a medicine, you're, you're giving a medicine to people who are already sick. You know, there's a lower bar there than if you're giving something to healthy people. You're giving it to a lot more people to prevent a disease, um, and even a rare side effect is, is a problem. And I think that scares away a lot of the vaccine makers. We know, I mean, that the I think vaccine resistance is actually a real puts a real dent in the market because I mean, like the Lyme disease vaccine was pulled from the market years ago for 
you know, some unsubstantiated uh, claims of side effects. It doesn't seem like um, companies really want to wade into those territories if there is all of this resistance. How much of that is is real, though? I mean, are there safety issues with vaccines? Are there any big problems that we just don't know about? There are very, very, I mean, with the, the coronavirus vaccine, we've seen the data come in for the CDC has been tallying that up. We've had millions of doses that have been deployed. And I mean, what, you know, a few hundred cases of some very, very rare side effects, most of which resolve on their own, right? Um, Apoorva, you're probably more familiar with some of these latest, latest numbers. Uh, yeah, other than myocarditis, that very rare heart problem with COVID vaccines, we haven't really seen many problems at all. With J&J, there was that issue of blood clots in some young women, but they're all extremely, extremely rare. So uh, yeah, I think with COVID vaccines, we've definitely been, been very lucky. And even with other vaccines, I, I think of vaccines as actually much safer than a lot of drugs we take that have pretty strong side effects. But as you said, I think people just have this really strong psychological barrier against taking something when they're not sick. I mean, we all sort of live with this hubris, right? It's not going to happen to me. I'm not going to get it. Everybody else around me might, but I'm going to be fine. So I just don't want to take the chance. Uh, so I think there are a lot of people who think that way. And that's partly why the, the anti-vax movement has gotten so strong during COVID too, because there are so many people who don't take COVID very seriously. The mRNA vaccines, especially the, the safety profile seems to be great. And you know, in other infectious disease uh, worlds, there's a lot of excitement actually about these now for HIV, which you mentioned, and for malaria, which I was talking about earlier. Before we move off this vaccine development, this particular specific topic, um, what do you think the public doesn't know about vaccine development that you learned during the reporting of this book that you, you think they should know? I, yeah, I think that there were a couple of things. So I, number one, um, one of the dramas in the book that I found very fascinating that didn't get that much coverage was how do you pull off a vaccine trial amid a pandemic? How do you plan it? You know, because of this whole process of, you know, the, the possibility that the disease is going to vanish um, before you have a chance to test it. And, uh, you know, one of the details that I loved uncovering was when the National Institutes of Health was advising on the Operation Warp Speed trials, they actually had an ethical consult about running the trials in prisons, which were experiencing these horrific outbreaks. And they were thinking this could be a way to very quickly test the vaccine. You remember we were hearing about challenge trials, that, that there were a great number of people who were thinking that's gonna be the most efficient way to do it. Well, the NIH just said, you know what, actually this is naturally happening in this place. In the end, we didn't need to use all of these tools because COVID spread across the country over the summer by the early fall, it, it was clear that we we're gonna get an answer very quickly. But I think the, the tools that were developed in terms of tracking the spread of the disease and figuring out how to locate the trials, that could potentially be very useful for running trials on a very fast timeline uh, with other infection, emerging diseases. So I hope those lessons um, are, are shared. I, you know, I'm not a politics reporter, for, but I'm, this, I, don't, I barely knew how government worked when I started this. And um, I just found myself so impressed by like the dedicated civil servants all at all levels. Um, even I, I dare say political appointees who are, uh, you know, are often not not very uh, glorified and have you know they have their issues. But it was just there was so much passion, and you must have experienced this talking to people. Like uh, a crisis just brings together people, and it also divides them in certain ways. And I. Um, I learned so much talking to, to civil servants. Yeah, that was definitely something that was very striking. I think about this pandemic is, you know, I've reported on the CDC before and the FDA before, and people are generally, you know, go through their press office, they, they follow all the rules. But during the pandemic, so many of them were willing to talk to the press because they felt things were being done that they completely disagreed with. And one of the things that I was really impressed with is that they felt they were being villainized in the media. They felt really demoralized because they were being treated poorly. All their work was being warped and destroyed by the Trump administration. They were getting all this political interference and things they wrote were getting rewritten to say something that they would never stand behind. And yet, you know, many of them didn't want to quit. 
they wanted to quit, but they decided, no, I'm actually more needed here. Even though I'm unhappy, even though I'm miserable, I want to stay and serve my country. And I thought that was just a really, you know, powerful thing to see all these civil servants, as you said, you know, and the CDC, a lot of them are actually commissioned officers, they're part of the military, and they have this really strong sense of service, which I, I think I, I didn't fully realize before the pandemic, how committed and how intensely focused they are on their mission. That was a very cool thing to see. You're right. Yeah, I'm curious to report, because I mean, you have done so much reporting on the CDC, like you mentioned, you you've reported on the, the guidance documents uh, being being altered with respect to the testing policies last year. And then this year, going back to the vaccines, we have this, this interesting situation with the booster shots. I mean, uh, this was something I, I really struggled with in reporting this book was understanding what is political interference? You know, th there's this sort of divide between how does an administration be operational, but how does it take into <laughs> account scientific advice? I am wondering if you have a clearer view of that topic, having, having considering your reporting. You know, I think there's always been political interference with every administration. It's just a matter of degrees. And the Trump administration took it to an all new level where you don't really have to guess at what political interference meant. It meant people would say one thing and they were completely overruled and asked to do something entirely different. So, you know, the testing one that you mentioned, for example, there were scientists who were working very hard on a guidance document and then essentially, Brett Chirua, the Deputy uh, Health and Human Services Secretary, came in, rewrote the whole thing, and then that's what went up as if it had been written by CDC scientists. So that's, you know, the, the one extreme of political interference where they're just being completely railroaded. The Biden administration, it's been a little bit different in some ways, a little bit subtler, but I think the end result is similar in that they got so far ahead of this conversation on boosters, you know, pr President Biden went up there and said, boosters for everyone way before any of the federal scientists had had a chance to review anything. And so it's like a fait accompli, like they, they couldn't have done anything else. They had to authorize the boosters because otherwise they would have really created a lot of confusion for the public. It would have shown some level of dissension within the government that would have been you know, uncomfortable, not just for the administration, but for all citizens and whom to believe. Do we believe the White House? Do we believe the FDA? And so, you know, one of the things that I've been really fascinated by in the last few weeks to months is that individually, when I've talked to any of the advisors to the FDA or the CDC, the vast majority of them do not believe that boosters are required for anybody under 65. And yet we've seen unanimous vote after unanimous vote go through to say, yes, let's have boosters for everybody. So it's a little bit confusing. And I think that that's a different kind of political interference where he basically, he tied their hands without meaning to perhaps, or maybe he was intentional, but he sort of made it clear that that's what would happen. And the booster story has been incredible and it's been incredibly frustrating for me since my book ended in May of 2021. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I, I think uh, I, I think it, it, it's put me in this interesting position, and in that people are always asking me, the guy who wrote the vaccine book, should I get a booster or not? <laughs> um, and where and, where did you come down on that? Uh, well, I, I say, well, if you got the Moderna shot, maybe wait a little bit longer, because <laughs> we've seen some evidence that the the immunity from the Moderna shot lasts a little bit longer. Um, but it, it, it was striking to me how much Pfizer also was pushing very early on to make boosters part of the conversation. And um, I mean, Pfizer has, has played this game very well. I will say that. <laughs> extremely well, extremely well. They pulled way ahead of all of the competition and they just keep going. I mean, with, with the kids, with the boosters, they were just so far ahead of all the other companies and, and they have made record profits, like you said. So it's worked out very well for them. And I think that's a really good place to end this conversation because uh, yeah, I think it really illustrates something that's so true of your book, which is you learn a lot, but also it's highly entertaining in the true Brendan Burrell style of writing. So thank you so much for answering all of my prying questions. <laughs> Thanks for chatting with me again, Porva. I really appreciate it. Thank you.